Hi guys, this is Mrs. Boy, and this is part two of the AP Biology Lecture on making DNA into protein. So transcription and translation, chapter 17 in the um, Pearson Biology book for AP Bio, if you're um, using that. And I just finished part one of the lecture. It's a half an hour. Um, screencast on basically leading up to transcription. And so we're gonna start right into transcription now with the actual um, details of transcription in eukaryotes, okay? So we know it's different. We know it's a lot simpler in, um, in prokaryotes than it is in eukaryotes. So in eukaryotes, we have these proteins called transcription factors. And transcription factors are special proteins that kind of shepherd the RNA polymerase to the place on the DNA that's going to be transcribed into messenger RNA. And those transcription factors, um, we're gonna learn more about those in the next chapter about how they actually facilitate transcription, but they're really um, important. And Together with the RNA polymerase II, which is the major enzyme in eukaryotes, the promoter, which is the region of the DNA that the RNA, RNA polymerase sits on, and these transcription factors together are called the transcription initiation complex. And remember, in particular, the DNA area where the RNA polymerase sits on is called the promoter area or the ta-ta box because it is it has a sequence of TATA that we can see in a lot of eukaryotic organisms. And so here, here we have, so remember this is initiation. So we have our DNA um, non-template strand and our DNA template strand, that's, that's going to cause, that's going to be the DNA strand that's going, that the messenger RNA is going to be built upon, built upon. And here we see, we have our transcription factors. So these are these purple things that are here. And those are going to help shepherd or guide the RNA polymerase II, which is the major enzyme involved in transcription for eukaryotes, to sit right where it needs to sit on the DNA to begin to transcribe a new messenger RNA strand using the template strand or the non-coding strand of DNA as its guide. And transcription would then start. So we're gonna learn more about all of these families of protein um, that we call transcription factors. And some of them can actually cause the DNA to fold back over on itself. Some of them can actually thwart um, the attachment of the messenger RNA, uh, RNA polymerase on the DNA. So just recognize that we're gonna be talking about a little bit more detail. It's really interesting how all of the biochemistry of this works out to get a messenger RNA strand produced. In elongation, what we're going to see happen is that the RNA polymerase is going to move along the DNA, untwisting it, breaking the hydrogen bonds. Remember, it kind of does the whole thing as it adds new nucleotide bases at a rate of about 10 to 20 at a time. And um, it is going to be... Um, about 40 nucleotides per second in eukaryotes. It's a lot faster in prokaryotes. And a gene can be simultaneously um, transcribed by several RNA polymerases. They kind of line up like they would at, you know, at a big airport and they just tra can transcribe multiple pieces of messenger RNA transcript. Remember, in termination, in a bacteria, there is actually a stop codon. It's pretty simple because the, 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 DNA, the messenger RNA just falls away, the RNA polymerase falls off, and we have our messenger, um, we have our messenger RNA transcript that is gonna, then going to be translated into a protein. In eukaryotes, the polymerase continues transcription until after the 
the pre-messenger RNA, so this is going to be the piece of the molecule before any editing is done, is going to cleave off of that and the polymerase is going to eventually fall off. But it's a little bit more complicated because we have these signals called a polyadenylation signal. And that is what's on the DNA. And so we can see here that I have this polyadenylation signal that is going to be a bunch of A's that are lined up. And what that causes is in the messenger RNA transcript, which is this green thing right here, it actually causes the RNA to fold up into a little hairpin loop and that causes the RNA polymerase to pause and then eventually will disengage. That little hairpin turn kind of stops transcription. And then the messenger RNA transcript is going to separate from the template strand of the DNA. So here again, we have a little cartoon of that, of that polyadenylation signal right here, right? And then the little hairpin turn that forms from base pairing on the messenger RNA, and that stops the part, the RNA polymerase from doing any more transcription, and that falls off of the, um, the, the DNA. So of course, this is all happening in the nucleus, right, of the eukaryotes. So now we're going to talk about how in eukaryotic cells, you can modify your messenger RNA after transcription. So there are enzymes that are going to do that, and we call this RNA processing, and it happens at both ends. So we do something to the beginning of the messenger RNA transcript molecule, and we do something to the end. And then we also edit parts in the middle. In prokaryotes, what you transcribe is what you translate. There's no modification. So that's a really good thing to remember, okay? Make sure you get that in your notes. In prokaryotes, you transcribe what you translate. There's no modification. It's very simple. So here's what's going to happen in RNA in eukaryotes. So the beginning of the pre-messenger RNA molecule, this just means before we edit or change anything to it, it receives a five prime cap, all right? And we think that five prime cap of bases helps to stabilize the molecule and helps it also negotiate it out of the nuclear pore. Remember, it has to get to the cytoplasm where the ribosome is. We also add a poly A tail, which is going to just be A, 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 that are going to go on the three prime end or the tail end. And again, we think that these modifications help facilitate the export of the messenger RNA. It helps the uh, messenger RNA to attach to the ribosome when it gets out to the cytoplasm. And we also think that it might help protect the messenger RNA against hydrolytic enzymes. So those are enzymes in the cytoplasm that would be cutting up and recycling messenger RNA back into its nucleotides. So here is an R RNA processing in eukaryotes. So here's my five prime cap. So that's a, um, some, uh, a special molecular cap that goes on the end of the, um, of the beginning of the messenger RNA transcript. And there's my start codon. This is the actual protein coding region, right? So here would be the start codon and the stop codon um, of, of of, um, of the original DNA code. And then we add the polyadenylation signal, right? That's, that's telling it uh, that this is where the, the um, uh, RNA polymerase would fall off. And then we add a poly A tail. So all of those things now, my, that uh, begins the alteration of my messenger RNA transcript. But now we're coming to the really interesting part. And, and I just want to pre, um, prefix that comment with um, a very interesting observation. So this worm right here is called a nematode worm. And um, it has about 20,000 genes. Here is probably one of the more famous scientists, Albert Einstein. And guess what? He has about 20,000 genes too. 
And when we started with the genome project um, back in the in the 2000s, we thought that we had you know a lot more genes than a nematode worm. Um, we thought we had 200,000, and then we thought, well, we've got about 100,000, and then we thought, well, okay, we've got 50,000, and then it came down to just 20. And so how in the world can something as complicated as a human have the same number of genes as a nematode worm? And the answer is, is that we can do some very crafty editing of our messenger RNA. And so I don't know if you do any type of film editing, maybe you edit some film on your phone, but you could take some raw footage of a film and depending on how you edited that film, you could make several different scenes that would be completely different from each other. And that's the basis of what we call RNA splicing. And again, this is just in eukaryotes. And so there are non-coding regions of the messenger RNA transcript that we call introns for intervening sequence. We also have parts of the messenger RNA that we call exons, and those are expressed. That's what I would suggest that you memorize. memorize. Exons are expressed into the amino acid sequence of a protein. And so RNA splicing is this editing process where you cut out the introns and kind of um, edit together the exons and the exons are then what go out to the ribosome to get them to be expressed into a protein. And this RNA splicing is carried out by a conglomeration of this big splicing machine, molecular machine called a spliceosome. And a spliceosome is a hybrid of a bunch of proteins, but also a special kind of um, small nuclear ribonuclear proteins or SNRPs, all right, SNRNPs, that are going to recognize the splice sites on the messenger RNA. So here we go. Here's our SNRPs here, our SNRNPs. We have some other proteins that come together to make this big molecular uh, cutting machine called a spliceosome. And what that thing does is it's going to cut out the introns and splice together the exons. And the exons then are gonna be expressed into proteins. So I have just a very quick little one minute video that I want to show you that really shows this great. This is for the Cold Spring from the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, and it is really awesome. So I'm going to show you this. As DNA is transcribed into RNA, it needs to be edited to remove non-coding regions or introns shown in green. This editing process is called splicing, which involves removing the introns, leaving only the yellow protein coding regions called exons. RNA splicing begins with assembly of helper proteins at the intron-exon borders. These splicing factors act as beacons to guide small nuclear riboproteins to form a splicing machine called the spliceosome. The animation is showing this happening in real time. The spliceosome then brings the exons on either side of the intron very close together, ready to be cut. One end of the intron is cut and folded back on itself to join and form a loop. The spliceosome then cuts the RNA to release the loop and join the two exons together. The edited RNA and intron are released and the spliceosome disassembles. This process is repeated for every intron in the RNA. Numerous spliceosomes shown here in purple assemble along the RNA. Each spliceosome removes one intron releasing the loop before disassembling. In this example, three introns are removed from the RNA to leave the complete instructions for a protein. So that's pretty cool, right? Um, it's just amazing the, um, just the elegance and the complexity of these proteins and what they can do um, 
to make just 20,000 genes go a lot further because of the creative editing that they can do. So now I have to show you another new term. This is called a ribozyme. It turns out that spliceosomes are an example of a ribozyme. And for once, I would say the name of this specific thing actually reflects what it does. Remember, it kind of looks like the word enzyme, but remember enzymes are proteins, right? Well, as it turns out, we have discovered through this process that RNA can act like an enzyme. And so the discovery of ribozymes are now rendering obsolete this idea that biological catalysts are all proteins. We know now that they can actually be made of RNA, catalytic RNA molecules. And a spliceosome is a great example of a ribozyme. So what is the evolutionary importance of introns and exons? Well, this is why we can get away with such few genes as humans, because of alternative RNA splicing. We can cut out different sections of introns depending on what protein needs to be made. And then we can splice those together in the, the remaining exons in different ways to make different proteins. And so because of that, the number of proteins that an organism can make uh, like humans is much greater than just its number of genes. So look at this different editing, right? So with the same piece of chromosomal DNA, depending on which way I edit out my, my introns and splice together my exons, I can have three different messenger RNA post-transcriptional um, editing and I am going to end up making three different proteins from the same section of DNA because of alternative RNA splicing. That's pretty cool. So this is just a great little summary of what we've learned so far about the difference between uh, eukaryotes and prokaryotes. And so one of the things that I haven't taught you yet is this thing called an operon. And this is how bacterial genes are organized into how they turn genes on and off. So we're gonna talk about those in the next chapter. Um, but this is just a nice little review. You could pause this now if you want to um, and, uh, and make sure you get these into your notes. So, so far we've just talked about one type of RNA mainly, and that is the messenger RNA. But now we're gonna talk about ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA to get to the other two big players in the translation part of our central dogma. So translation is going to occur in the cytoplasm of eukaryotes, and of course, just in the bacteria in, um, in prokaryotes. And this is going to um, incorporate the messenger RNA that I can see right here. This big green thing that is a ribosome that's gonna have a large subunit and a small subunit that come together. And then we're gonna have these little turquoise things that we see here. These are our transfer RNAs that are like little delivery trucks that bring a specific amino acid to the correct part of the ribosome. And we're gonna see that we have a P site, we have an A site, and um, we have a site where the, um, the uh, transfer RNA is gonna fly off and go get another uh, amino acid. So here is a, a very quick little video about translation. And I wanna show you that before we get started in on the specifics of translation. This one is just the basics. When the RNA copy is complete, it snakes out into the outer part of the cell. Then in a dazzling display of choreography, all the components of a molecular machine lock together around the RNA to form a miniature factory called a ribosome. It translates the genetic information in the RNA into a string of amino acids that will become a protein. Special transfer molecules, the green triangles, 
bring each amino acid to the ribosome. The amino acids are the small red tips attached to the transfer molecules. There are different transfer molecules for each of the 20 amino acids. Each transfer molecule carries a three-letter code that is matched with the RNA in the machine. Now we come to the heart of the process. Inside the ribosome, the RNA is pulled through like a tape. The code for each amino acid is read off, three letters at a time, and matched to three corresponding letters on the transfer molecules. When the right transfer molecule plugs in, the amino acid it carries is added to the growing protein chain. Again, you are watching this in real time. And after a few seconds, the assembled protein starts to emerge from the ribosome. Ribosomes can make any kind of protein. It just depends what genetic message you feed in on the RNA. In this case, the end product is hemoglobin. The cells in our bone marrow churn out 100 trillion molecules of it per second. And as a result, our muscles, brain, and all the vital organs in our body receive the oxygen they need. That's pretty cool, isn't it? All right, so let's talk about transfer RNAs, all right? The molecules of transfer RNAs are not identical. Um, each one of them is going to carry a specific amino acid on one end, as we saw in the video. And then the other end has three bases of that RNA that are sticking out, and we call that the anticodon. And the anticodon is going to complementary base pair with the codon on the messenger RNA strand. And that's how it's going to know where to bring its amino acid cargo. So the transfer RNA molecules are only about 800, excuse me, 80 nucleotides long, and they flatten into a plane that's going to look kind of like a little boomerang shape. And the transfer molecule, transfer RNA molecule looks kind of like a clover leaf. And the hydrogen bonds um, are actually folding it into this 3D shape that we're going to see. So you can see that it looks kind of like a clover leaf. The anticodon is going to be at the base here, opposite of where the amino acid is going to attach. And that anticodon is going to complementary base pair to the messenger RNA strand only where the bases pair up. And it's going to do opposite bases, complementary base pairing. And so the cartoon that the book uses looks kind of like the little, a little, little snuffed out cigarette butt. And the amino acid attachment would be at the top there. So it should not surprise you that an enzyme is going to be responsible for getting the correct amino acid on the correct transfer RNA molecule. And that enzyme is called amino acyl transfer RNA synthetase, all right? And that enzyme is the thing that's going to bring the amino acid on the right transfer RNA molecule. The, the uh, base pairing that occurs between the anticodon of the transfer RNA and the messenger RNA codon has a little bit of what we call wobble on the third base pair that allows some transfer RNA molecules to bind to more than one codon. And we'll talk about why that's important later. So here I have my big amino acyl transfer RNA synth the taste. So that's this big gray thing. And then I see a specific amino acid coming in here and I've got some ATP molecules. It should not, um, it shouldn't surprise you that this is going to cost energy to do this. And so what's going to happen is, is that the specific um, amino acid that is going to have a little phosphate group on there is now going to be um, bonded to the correct transfer amino acid. And so here is what it actually looks like on a computer model, and here's the cartoon of it. And so then that little amino acyl uh, transfer RNA molecule, we call, the, we call that transfer RNA molecule charged because it has the specific amino acid on it.
So ribosomes, remember, are the, um, I used to teach my freshmen, they're like the workbench of where the protein is made. We know that bacteria have ribosomes as well. Ribosomes are a little bit different in bacteria and eukaryotes, but they are made of two subunits, a large and a small subunit made of proteins, but also ribosomal RNA. And actually you can think of a, rib a ribosome as a ribozyme. All right, so it's going to be an example of an enzyme that's made of um, RNA. So here is what this is going to look like, okay? And we saw that beautiful animation that you saw there. Let's orient ourselves here. Here's the messenger RNA transcript. It's already had the introns cut out and the exons that are um, spliced together. Here's the five prime in and here's the three prime in. And the reading frame is going to be one codon, right? So it's going to be three bases and that's what's going to be read. And then we're going to have a place where basically three um, amino acids can fit onto this workbench of the ribosome. And the ribosome is made of a large subunit and a small subunit. What we're gonna see, just like you saw in the video is, is that amino acids are gonna be added like beads on a chain in a specific order that was dictated by the DNA that got copied onto the messenger RNA and now is gonna be assembled in um, on the ribosome. And so the specific amino acids are going to begin to build, and that's my growing polypeptide uh, chain. There's actually an exit tunnel in this, uh, this big, huge complex of proteins and um, ribosomal RNA. And we have a large subunit and a small subunit of the, RN of the, mess of the ribosome that fit together. And this is where the action is right here. And so now if we look at the cartoon model of this, we see that there is an A site where the amino acyl transfer RNA is gonna bind. We have a P that is where the peptidyl transfer RNA binding site is occurring. So in other words, this is where the peptide bond between the amino acids is gonna be catalyzed by this ribosome. And then the E site is the exit site. So now we're gonna have the empty transfer RNA being shifted to that spot and then it's gonna fly off. And then we have our messenger RNA binding site that's right here, kind of in between the large unit and the small subunit of the, um, of the ribosome. So now if we look at the ribosome with the transfer RNA molecules, we can see the whole thing play out, okay? So here is my A site, and here is my charged amino acid, and this little purple triangle is next amino acid that's gonna be added to the growing polypeptide strain. In the P site, we're going to see that that is where the peptide bond um, is going to be formed between this little amino acid and the growing chain that's here, and then, the whole thing is going to shift. So this guy, this uh, chain is going to be shifted onto here. This guy is going to move over. And then the empty um, transfer RNA is going to be in the E site, and then it is going to exit. Meanwhile, down here on the messenger RNA, we can see the reading frame of, of one codon, complementary base pairing with the anti-codon of the transfer RNAs. And so we can see that this is how the cell can get a very specific amino acid sequence based on just the chemistry of the transfer RNA, the messenger RNA, and the ribosome. So again, there are three different stages of translation, all right? So I want you to just stop for a second and try to keep this straight in your notes. We have talked about building so far three different things, okay? We talked about building another DNA molecule. So this was going to be our semi-conservative replication model where the original DNA molecule splits open and each of the old sides is the template for a new DNA molecule. That is back in DNA synthesis where it is in the S phase of the, of the cycle. That has an initiation, an elongation, and a termination, and it's got a bunch of enzymes, but the main one is going to be DNA polymerase. Then we talked about building a messenger RNA, that's transcription. And that 
is also broken into initiation, elongation, and termination of a messenger RNA protein, okay? Now we're gonna build a polypeptide. And there are three stages of that. There is initiation, elongation, and termination of what? Well, we're building a polypeptide strand. The, the product of translation is a polypeptide strand or a protein. All right. And all of these stages are going to require protein factors that are going to help in translational process and help uh, control that. All right. So in the initiation stage, we basically are going to have everything come together. We got to have the messenger RNA come together. We have to have the two ribosomal subunits come together. We have to have a transfer RNA with the first amino acid coming in. And all of that is going to be initiating translation. The very first transfer RNA is going to be a special initiator transfer RNA. And it is going to have an anticodon that is going to complementary base pair with the start codon AUG on the messenger RNA, all right? And then proteins called initiation factors for translation are going to bring in the large subunit of the, of the ribosome until the translation, translation initiation complex is complete. All right, so let's look at this, right? So I have my small uh, subunit of my ribosome here. I have my messenger RNA transcript here. I have my initiator transfer RNA that has methionine. Remember, the first amino acid is always methionine. And there I can see a blow up of my complementary base pairing between the red messenger RNA and the turquoise transfer RNA. This is going to uh, require um, energy and it's in the form of GTP, right? Which is a cousin to ATP. And so now what we're going to happen is that what is not shown on this picture is a bunch of translation factors, which are proteins, all right? Remember we had transcription factors that were proteins that are gonna guide and moderate the system. And now we have translation factors that are not shown in this picture, just so you're not gonna go crazy, okay? And so now I have my translation initiation complex, and now we're going to have elongation occur of the polypeptide strand. So in elongation, we're going to involve um, proteins called elongation factors that are going to uh, be um, responsible for codon recognition, peptide bond uh, formation, and translocation. So what's going to happen here is I have my amino acid uh, strand here. I have my new charged transfer RNA coming into the A site. I'm going to have um, use some GTP and a, that is going to help facilitate the peptide bond being formed here. The whole chain is gonna be transferred over to this first transfer RNA. This guy is now empty. I'm gonna use more GTP to translocate. So what's gonna happen is the messenger RNA is gonna move down one codon. And now I have um, the, the transfer RNA with the polypeptide chain on it now in the P site. And now this empty transfer RNA that was right here translocates to the E site on the ribosome and it's gonna leave. And so now I'm ready for the whole process to start again. So that's an elongation. Termination of the polypeptide strand is going to occur when the stop codon of the messenger RNA reaches the A site of the ribosome. The A site of the ribosome is going to accept a protein called a release factor, which is kind of in the same shape as a transfer RNA, but it's not really. And that causes the addition of a water molecule instead of amino acid. And that's what cuts off the polypeptide strand and now it's, um, and translation is complete. So here we have the 
my growing polypeptide strand on my ribosome. Here is my stop codon on my messenger RNA. And this yellow thing is the release factor. It's a protein that's going to fit into the A site, and it is going to catalyze with the help of GTP an addition of a water molecule um, instead of, of a peptide bond, and that is going to clip off the polypeptide chain, and then that's going to go on and be modified somewhere to be a grown-up protein somewhere. So one of the things that I wanted to show you is um, something called a polyribosome. So a number of ribosomes can translate a single messenger RNA simultaneously. All right, and it calls a structure called a polyribosome or a polysome for short. And so you might think, well, why, why would the cell do that? Well, it's pretty evident that that is a way to make a whole bunch of copies of protein very quickly. And we see polyribosomes in eukaryotes and in prokaryotes. And so what do they look like? They look like this. Okay, so here's a cartoon. Here is my messenger RNA. Here is a bunch of ribosomes that we call the polyribosome. And then you can see they're just coming in here and they're just, you know, translating that messenger RNA over and over and over. And I've got my uh, whole bunch of copies of proteins that are being made. And then at the end of the messenger RNA, they would fall apart into their two different subunits. So this is an actual electron microscope of that process. So um, at the end of translation, you might think, okay, I've got my baby protein that just be, that's just been made, but that's usually not a functional protein, right? There's usually some things that have to happen to it in order for it to be functional. And so polypeptide chains are gonna be modified after translation. And so there are what we call post-translational modification. Okay, so think of what that's saying, post-translational, so after translation, modification of newly made polyproteins. And so remember that the three-dimensional shape of a polypeptide chain is going to be spontaneously folded depending on its amino acid sequence. Um, and that's, uh, that's called tertiary structure. And then if you have more than one polypeptide that are gonna be um, associated together, that is called the quaternary structure, okay? So proteins may also require some post-translational modifications in order for them to be fully functional. Some polypeptides are activated by enzymes that are gonna cleave them, or some polypeptides come along to form subunits of another protein. So there are two basic places where ribosomes are in the cell, and this is really important, okay? We can have free ribosomes in the cytosol, and that's what you're going to see in bacteria. All you have are free ribosomes, all right? But in eukaryotes, we have ribosomes that can also be attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. And we re remember we call that the rough endoplasmic reticulum when they're kind of studded with ribosomes. So proteins are made on both those ribosomes. They're made on free ribosomes and they're made on bound ribosomes bound to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. We see that free ribosomes are mostly synthesizing proteins that function in the cytosol. But bound ribosomes on the endoplasmic reticulum are going to make proteins um, in the endomembrane system that are going to be secreted from the cell, modified. Remember, they're going to go to the Golgi, and they can be modified and packaged and, and excreted from the cell. Ribosomes, though, are identical. Whether they're free or bound, they can switch back and forth um, and do either job. Polypeptide synthesis is always going to begin in the cytosol, but sometimes the synthesis is going to include bringing the whole ribosome with the growing polypeptide strand to the endoplasmic reticulum for further modification. 
And um, remember, those are the ones that are proteins that are probably going to be excreted. And that is marked by something called a signal peptide. The signal peptide is the part of the growing chain that kind of says, take me to the endoplasmic reticulum. And so it can be attached there. So here is a picture. Um, well, let's talk first. The signal recognition pro particle, I said, is going to bring it to the um, part of the endoplasmic reticulum where it's going to be then modified. So here we go. Here is a single, here is a signal um, peptide that's right here. Here is my signal recognition protein that is going to then kind of escort the messenger RNA, the two pieces of the ribosome that are bound together and this growing peptide chain onto the endoplasmic reticulum membrane, okay? And so it kind of guides it to there. There's a receptor protein that bonds to the signal recognition protein that bonds there. And now you're going to see, and of course the peptide is the one that signaled this, it, it, it bonds with it. And then it comes down to this um, translocation complex, which is where the protein now is going to be synthesized. Look at, see how it's growing, growing, growing. But now it's growing in the lumen, which is the inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. And so it's just a way that if this, protein was meant to be secreted from the cell. This is how it gets to the endoplasmic reticulum where it's going to be modified and then and, and basically packaged by the Golgi and then excreted from the cell. So now let's go back and talk about um, wobble a little bit. I mentioned it earlier. So here wobble is going is a hypothesis that um, puts forth the idea that when a when the when the bases of a codon of the messenger RNA bond to the transfer RNA anticodon, that the first two bases bond very um, very strongly, but the third base can have some wobble. In other words, it doesn't have to be as picky about the base that it complementary base pairs with. And so the idea of this is that it um, allows some leeway in um, preventing misformed proteins that are just a matter of one point mutation in the DNA. So it's kind of like, oh, it's kind of like some insurance that it doesn't have to be exact for that third, um, that third base. And it also is probably something that helps the speed of how fast these proteins can be synthesized um, because you don't have to, that, that third um, complementary base pair doesn't have to be as strong. So talking about mutations, let's talk a little bit, now that we know more about transcription and translation, let's talk a little bit more about these mutations. We already know about point mutations, and that's where a single nucleotide of the DNA is going to be changed. A great hip pocket example of a point mutation should be um, a mutant hemoglobin DNA that we know happens in sickle cell, right? And so that's a great example of that. So you can see my one base different in the DNA ends up with a, um, a, a mutated messenger RNA for sickle cell hemoglobin. And then I have one amino acid that is different in the amino acid sequence for normal hemoglobin versus um, sickle cell hemoglobin. And that's what causes that um, sickle cell hemoglobin protein causes the red blood cells of people with sickle cell to be malformed. And then you have all those problems that um, are associated with sickle cell. So point mutations within a gene can be divided into two categories. We can have base pair substitutions or base pair insertions or deletions. All right. So um, 
one type of point mutation can be something called a silent mutation, all right? So in a silent mutation, you are not going to have um, any change in the amino acid sequence, okay? So let's look here. So here we have the wild type DNA, right? And here's my messenger RNA, and then here's my amino acid sequence, right? Three bases that are gonna code for this particular sequence of four amino acids in this example. But with one point mutation, an A instead of a G, that's going to result in a U instead of a C, but it doesn't have any difference on the amino acid sequence because there are multiple um, codons that code for glycine, okay? And so this particular point mutation didn't change anything. Here is an example of a missense, a missense mutation, point mutation. And here I have a point mutation that I had a T instead of a C. Well, that ends up giving me an A instead of a G in my messenger RNA. And now that codon is going to give me a different amino acid. So look, here's the amino acid sequence I should have gotten. Here's the amino acid sequence I now have. And so we call that a missense mutation because it caused a change in the amino acid sequence. We also have nonsense point mutations. And a nonsense point mutation is where the point mutation made the messenger RNA codon into a stop instead of a code for an amino acid. So here I got an A instead of a T in the DNA. I have a U instead of an A. And AUG is one of those punctuation codons that say stop. So this would be an example of a nonsense, a nonsense mutation. A frame shift mutation is going to be an insertion, right? Where you can insert an an additional um, base, and that is going to mess up the, the reading frame for all of the codons downstream, okay? So that those can be pretty, pretty big. We can also have frame shift mutations if we have a deletion, right? So if you pull a, a base out, then you're also going to shift the reading frame um, in the whole downstream piece of the DNA after that. And here, if you have three base pair deletions, you can have an amino acid missing, but it would not be a frame shift because it's, it's not gonna mess up the three base reading pairs on, on the down, uh, the down uh, slope, downstream side of the DNA. So we have base pair substitutions, we have silent mutations, which we talked about means no effect, missense mutations means a different amino acid, and nonsense mutation means it's gonna be a stop codon, which leads to a non-functional um, protein. We talked about insertions and deletions. These can have the most dramatic effect on a protein um, more, than just, uh, more than just a substitution can. And Remember that in, a, in an insertion or a deletion of a nucleotide is going gonna, is gonna to cause a frame shift mutation of everything downstream. Mutations can be spontaneous. Um, they can occur during DNA replication, during recombination of DNA, or repair of DNA. And mutagens are going to be any kind of physical or chemical agent that causes a mutation. So. Um, for example, we know that uh, ultraviolet um, radiation can is a mutagen. But I want you to remember again that muta mutations can be bad, they can be detrimental, they can be beneficial, or they can be neutral, like not bad or good, depending on the specific environmental conditions of that organism, right? So it's not that mutations are bad, they can be good, they can be bad, or they can be neutral. So I wanna finish up here talking about the three great groups of all living things that we call domains. And there are three great domains in 
um, living things. We have the bacteria, which are sometimes called the U bacteria. EU means true. And so these are just regular bacteria that we know and love. Okay, some good, some bad, but they're all in there. We also have the eukaryote. These are all the organisms that have eukaryotic cells in them. And of course, this would include fungi, plants, animals, and of course us, so we're way down here on that little branch. And then this other great domain of life, life called the archaebacteria. These are very ancient extremophile bacteria that we're gonna learn about later. And the reason why I'm bringing this up now is because we have a lot in common, even though these guys are prokaryotic organisms, the way that their um, protein synthesis works, we have more in common with them than they do with other bacteria, which is kind of weird. So the RK tend to resemble eukaryotic in the respect of the way their RNA polymerases are, the way their termination of transcription and their ribosomes are. So because of those things, we are chemically more related to those weird extremophile bacteria than regular bacteria are. Bacteria, remember, can transcribe and translate a single gene at the same time, right? Because they don't have to go out to the cytoplasm. Remember, in eukaryote, transcription and translation are separated by um, uh, the nuclear envelope. And in archaebacteria, um, transcription and translation are going to be similar to bacteria. So let's go back to this idea of what is a gene. All right, so first we thought that a gene was just a discrete unit of inheritance. And then we thought that a gene was a specific nucleotide sequence in, of a chromosome. And then we thought that a DNA sequence, uh, that a gene was a DNA sequence that code for a specific protein. But now we know that a gene can be defined as a, region of DNA that is going to be expressed to produce either a final protein product or an RNA molecule, all right? So this kind of shows you, this is in your textbook and it would be a great idea to pause the video here. And this is obviously eukaryotic transcription and translation. And just see if you can tell the whole story by looking at this to either yourself or to a study partner. This is a good review slide. But I wanna go back to the question that I showed you at the very beginning of part one. So we were looking at this albino deer and saying, you know, how is it that you can have um, a different genotype and how does that really relate to a phenotype now that we know what protein transcription uh, and translation is evolving. So one of the things that I want you to think about is that there's a bunch of different checks and balances on DNA, RNA, and proteins, okay? So this actually could happen at one of, of many different areas, okay? So a genotype, if you have a recessive or a dominant um, uh, gene, gene um, that that can be, um, well, you wouldn't have excessive, you wouldn't have a recessive or dominant gene, you would have a recessive allele, but it's gonna be one of the, of the pieces of DNA if you are heterozygous, say. So one of the things that can happen is that the dominant gene could be transcribed and translated at a higher rate. The recessive, um, gene might not be transcribed or translated, or it might be transcribed and translated at a lower level, at a lower rate. The recessive messenger RNA transcript might not be expressed. There might be proteins that come in and cut it to pieces and it might not be expressed. Or maybe it is expressed, but then the actual functional protein does not function with the recessive gene the same way that it would with the dominant gene. So there are lots of different places that we learn now about how genotype is related to phenotype. 
and I and I hope that it makes you um, wonder and think about all this. This is a lot, um, but I hope that you got some good notes on this, and I will see you back.